So for the second scenario, you are called code four for a patient acting severely violent and punching holes in their walls at home. The patient name is Dwight and he lives with his parents. He's 32 years old and his parents state he is known to use cocaine. However, he's been trying to stop. He lives in his basement and they heard loud noises and screaming. They found him erratic and profusely sweating. He was yelling incomprehensible sounds and they've never seen him so agitated. They called 911. Upon your arrival, you maintain a safe distance and police are on the scene first. They manage to subdue the patient in a supine position. However, the patient was rapidly thrashing around and threatening everyone. You notice how flush the patient is and how diaphoretic he is too. Three police officers are having difficulties restraining the patient. You are unable to obtain any vital signs from the patient. The police state they found multiple bags of cocaine in the basement with lines on the table. So what is this patient experiencing and what sedative would be beneficial for this patient? Let's unpack this. So this patient was experiencing severe violent psychosis or excited delirium. And it's quite interesting to review that there is no truly established criteria for somebody to get the diagnosis of excited delirium. If you look at the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual or the International Classification of Diseases for the World Health Organization and so many more, there is no truly specific criteria for somebody to get that diagnosis. And usually it's just this mixture of clinical manifestations that we're all accustomed to and have reviewed before, such as patients exhibiting fear, shouting, violence, psychomotor agitation, mania, hyperactivity, all these kind of clumped together, but overall put themselves at risk, put us at risk, and put other bystanders at risk as well. And if you look at the risk factors for somebody going into excited delirium, it disproportionately affects young males, usually under 30 years old. Usually they have a history of psychiatric disorders. Approximately 50% of all patients going into excited delirium have a history of a psychiatric disorder. They're usually overweight and it's, they've usually taken a substance such as cocaine or methamphetamine. And this kind of precipitates the syndrome. And excited delirium term was actually kind of coined in the 1980s when coroners were doing autopsies on these patients and they couldn't have find any definitive findings. But this is with the clinical manifestations they experienced prior to death. And if you look at the mortality rate of someone in excited delirium, it's approximately 8 to like 16% which is quite significant. There could be from the mortality rate being that high from a significant publication bias or that there truly is no diagnostic criteria, so it's hard to differentiate different syndromes. But nonetheless, it's a pretty severe and consequential disorder. So if you look, usually if it precipitates individuals that use substances such as cocaine, methamphetamine, those mimic our sympathetic nervous system. So they get this large surge of catecholamines, epi, norepi, and as well as dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter involved in reward, positive behavior, and all this motivation to reinforce the behavior. So it blocks the reuptake of these neurotransmitters, such as dopamine and norepinephrine. And the reuptake means our cell's capability of handling a recycling system. So once a neurotransmitter is in the synapse of a neuron, it's able to be reuptake into the presynaptic neuron to be recycled, reused potentially, right? But if it blocks the reuptake of that, more dopamine is present in the synapse, and this leads to the propagation of action potentials in the postsynaptic neuron to initiate responses. So if you have these large surges of dopamine, that have positive reinforcement and evolve in hyperactivity. This is part of the manifestation and dopamine acts on our hypothalamus, which is involved in temperature regulation. And patients in excited delirium have hypothermia due to so many various reasons. So if we look here, 
here's the presynaptic neuron, here's the postsynaptic neuron, you have all your neurotransmitters, norepi, you can have serotonin, dopamine, and if they're not going back into the presynaptic neuron, they're more abundant to lead to these action potentials and this excitatory state. So there's a reuptake inhibition. You look, you have this increase in mesolimbic dopamine pathway. You know, the limbic system is involved in emotion and regulation. And if you increase the mesolimbic dopamine pathway, this is where dopamine is released or part of the areas. And if you use cocaine over time or any other drugs are quite addictive in nature, obviously this will desensitize you because your dopamine receptors are down regulated. And eventually there's so much abuse with these drugs, the mesolimbic dopamine pathway increases because, but it gets dysfunctional. And this is why in excited delirium, this can lead to the agitation, the combativeness, partially because it's so dysfunctional and it's not working appropriately that it causes this large surge of dopamine, but it has this dysfunctional dis response. And also your hypothalamus function is increased. And hypothalamus is one of the most prudent areas of our brain and it's involved in temperature regulation. So obviously if there's increased hypothalamus function, your internal set point of your temperature can be increased and this can lead to hypothermia. There's other reasons why patients could be hypothermic. One, if you're exerting yourself, you're physically so overactive, you're, you're fighting police officers or you're fighting other first responders, you're going to have an increase in your internal temperature, as well as the drugs themselves, cocaine, methamphetamine, those increase your internal temperature and increase heat production, as well as the sympathetic nervous system. You increase your heart rate, contractility, your blood vessels can dilate some areas or you cause facial constriction to the core. This creates more heat production as well. So all these things can raise their heat. But then again, they're so diaphoretic from all this heat production. You try to cool yourself down and the sympathetic nervous system response, you become severely dehydrated. And this can cause an imbalance in your electrolytes and that can help exacerbate or heighten the risk of seizures. And overall, this dysfunctional central nervous system, this is caused by increased neuronal firing and this overactivation of the dopamine receptors. And we already kind of alluded to some of these consequences, but obviously their autonomic hyperactivity is quite profound and they can get severely acidotic because you have this buildup of lactic acid, especially if you're fighting police officers and first responders, and this could lead to all this buildup and then this can contribute to seizures as well and all these other deleterious effects. Altered mental status. Obviously, you have central nervous system dysfunction, or you're dehydrated, you have electrolyte imbalances or the drugs. This can all lead to an altered mental status. So all these can compound and exacerbate one another. And eventually, this could increase the risk of seizures as well. And there's been some circumstances that rhabdomyolysis can occur because of the breakdown of muscle because of the fighting and the resistance, etc., and the superhuman strength that they're known to have during these states. So that can actually happen. So you can see all these very negative implications that excited delirium can cause. Now we need a medication that maximizes everyone's safety as well as customized to treat this patient safely. Ketamine is indicated for this patient under our current medical directives in Ontario for the pre-hospital setting. But again, it's, you can always weigh the risk for either medication depending on the circumstance because you need something that is quick and effective and then hopefully has limited side effect. Overall, this patient's experiencing excited delirium and severe violent psychosis. De-escalation methods obviously are first and it's good coronation with police, other first responders. And obviously it's paramount to state, especially with all the media reviewing this now. No, we've never been taught this. We never sedate patients just for the sake of police requests. This is why there's so many different ways we could treat these patients, de-escalation methods, trying to build that rapport, trying to find reversible causes. Then eventually, if our options are limited, depending on the circumstance, ketamine or another sedative could be warranted. Again, this kind of differs from the first case study where midazolam was indicated and beneficial for patients going through alcohol withdrawal.